the first thing that we're going to talk about today is instantaneous power in a balanced three phase network. All right, so let's say that we have a Y connected load. where each phase of our load represents a linear black box network. So we don't really care what's inside of it as long as it's some form of resistance capacitance and inductance that isn't time varying. okay? Such that over the A phase of the load, a time domain voltage VAN as a function of time, occurs and a time domain current IAN flows. And we have a similar situation for the B and C phases where we would just update those subscripts accordingly. Okay. So let's say that VAN of T is equal to EP from arbitrary phase voltage times the square root of two, since we're in the time domain. You know what, you're absolutely right. Thank you, Brandon. And then, a and omega t plus some phase angle theta v and i a n of t is equal to our phase current i p root two cosine omega t plus theta i. And we can say that VBN is VP root two cosine omega t plus theta v minus 120 degrees. IBN is IP square root of two cosine omega t plus theta i minus 120 degrees. And finally, the CN of t is equal to VP root two cosine omega t plus theta v minus 240 degrees and ICN of t, and that should be a lowercase i since it's an AC quantity, IP root two cosine omega t plus theta i minus 240 degrees. Okay, we have our six signals. 
now for the power. So the instantaneous power absorbed by our load, P of T, is going to be the instantaneous power absorbed by the A phase of our load, which is VAN multiplied by IAN plus the instantaneous power absorbed by the B phase of our load, VBN times IBN plus the instantaneous power absorbed by the C phase of our load, which is VCN. Okay. Since we're multiplying cosine functions together, we're going to have to go back to that trig identity. I'm going to write it down yet again, probably the fifth or sixth time in this class. So cosine angle one times cosine angle two is cosine angle one minus angle two, one half plus one half cosine angle one plus angle two. And applying this trig identity, what we're going to get then is that an instantaneous power P of T is going to be one half times square root of two times square root of two VP IP plus one half multiplied by two VP IP cosine twice omega t plus theta v plus theta i. That's for the A phase. Plus one half times two times VP IP plus one half times two VP IP cosine twice omega t. All right, so what I'm about to do here, effectively I'm just adding these two angles together. So omega t plus omega t gives me twice omega t, theta v plus theta i is gonna give me plus theta v plus theta i, and then negative 120 plus negative 120 is gonna be negative 240. So that's for my B phase. And then for my C phase, it's gonna look literally identical, except that I'm gonna have negative 480 degrees right here. All right, so I have three DC terms and three AC terms. My AC terms are all oscillating at the same frequency. So that means I can combine them together, right? So without using a bunch of terrifying trig, how would I combine three sinusoids with the same frequency together? I'd use complex numbers, right? So just for the sake of argument, let's call this guy one, one half times two times VP times IP. Let's just make it one for the sake of argument. And let's say that theta V and theta I are zero. So this guy has an angle of zero degrees. This guy has an angle of negative 240 degrees. And this guy has an angle of negative 480 degrees. What's one angle zero plus one angle negative 240 plus one angle negative 480? 
at zero. These three AC terms exactly cancel each other out. Leaving us with three halves times two EP times IP. Obviously, simply a constant value. Okay. So, what this means is that the instantaneous power absorbed by a balanced three phase load is the exact same thing as the average power absorbed by a balanced three phase load. This goes back way to the beginning of when we were talking about this stuff about why we use three phase voltage sources to supply induction motors. If a constant amount of power is supplied to the motor, it experiences a constant amount of torque and therefore the least amount of my, uh, mechanical vibrations as possible. So here's our instantaneous power relationship. Now, let's talk about complex power in balanced three phase slope. All right. So let's consider a balanced three phase Y Y network just to make the math as painless as it can be. A, B, and C. So this is VAN, VBN, and VCN. Let's say that I have some form of transmission line impedance. And finally, over here on the right hand side, I have my balanced Y connected load. All right. So <clears throat> I have a complex voltage VAN over the A phase of my load, a complex voltage VBN over the B phase, and a complex voltage VCN over the C phase. Additionally, I have a current IAN flowing through the A phase, a current IBN. Let me erase that and make it less terrible looking. Flowing through the B phase, and a current ICN flowing through the C phase. And we'll work with these quantities for now. Okay. So, the complex power absorbed in the A phase of the load is given by the product of RMS phasor voltage VAN times the complex conjugate of RMS phasor current IAN which is going to look like the magnitude 
a phase or voltage VAN times the magnitude of phase or current IAN with an angle of theta VAN minus theta IAN or the magnitude of VAN times the magnitude of IAN with an angle theta ZY. Where theta ZY just represents the angle of the impedance expressed in polar form. Following a very similar derivation, the complex power absorbed by the B phase is RMS phasor voltage VBN times the complex conjugate of RMS phasor current IBN, which comes out to be the magnitude of VAN times the magnitude of IAN with an angle of theta ZY. Where I've skipped a couple of steps here, so let me explain myself. VAN and VBN have to have the same magnitudes if this is a balanced three phase system. IAN and IBN have to have the same magnitudes if this is a balanced three phase system. Theta ZY must be the same over all three phases of our load for a balanced system, which means the complex power absorbed by the B phase of our load is literally identical to the complex power absorbed by the A phase of our load. It should not take a huge leap of faith to say that the C phase is going to do the exact same thing. So from this, we can say that the total complex power absorbed by our Y connected load is the sum of the power absorbed in the A phase plus the B phase plus the C phase, which is the same as three times the complex power absorbed in the A phase, which we can write as three VP IP angle A to Z, where VP is just a shorthand notation for the magnitude of the phase voltages in the load, and IP is just a shorthand notation for the magnitude of the phase currents in the load. Okay. All right, so what if, for whatever reason, we didn't know what the phase voltages were? What if we instead knew line voltages like VAB, VBC, and VCA, right? Well, since the magnitude of VAB is just square root of three times larger than the magnitude of VAN, what we will find is that we can also express this as the square root of three VL 
pi L angle theta Z, where VL represents our line voltages and IL represents our line currents. So that's a fantastic question. The answer is yes, but it's not intuitively obvious as to why. So let me explain exactly what I mean by that, okay? So we've derived this for a Y-connected load, all right? Where this square root of three down here is coming from the fact that there's a square root of three relationship between the phase voltage and the line voltage that we need to take care of. But our phase current and our line current literally represent the exact same quantity, okay? That's how it works for a Y connected load. For a delta connected load, VP and VL are the same thing. But IP and IL are not, right? So for a delta connected load, we should expect that our line current is the larger quantity because it branches off and forms our phase currents in our delta connected load. We've done numerous problems with this at this point, both here in the class and in the homework sets. And there is exactly a square root of three based relationship on how our line currents split into phase currents for our delta connected loads. So while we derive this explicitly for a Y connected load, it is perfectly valid for a delta connected load as well. Exactly right. But it's still the same exact same ratio, it turns out. So these are our complex power relationships. We can apply whichever one suits us, depending on what information is easiest to obtain, okay? Or if necessary, we can always literally go back to our single phase power relationships where if we can find the power absorbed by a single phase of our, uh, of our load, the three phase equivalent is just that number multiplied by three, okay? So whichever, is easiest is the one that we should use. So don't forget that you can go back and effectively use your simple definition of complex power V times I conjugate. Just recall that you need to multiply by three when there are three phases of the load involved. All right, so average power. actually makes me realize I think I forgot something in the previous iteration for the instantaneous power, but it'll be okay. Come up here. All right, so our average power is simply the real part of three VP IP angle theta Z. which is three VP IP cosine theta Z or equivalently, it's the real part of root three VL IL angle theta Z, which is root three VL IL cosine theta Z. Let me go back up to the front page real quick here so we can talk about what I forgot to do. Just as a quick aside, I'm not going to update this. When I do cosine theta one minus theta two, the omega T's cancel out but the theta V and the theta I don't. So I should actually have cosine theta V minus theta I here. 
here and here, which gives me three VP IP cosine theta B minus theta I, which would I, uh, exactly agree with the complex power derived version of the average power. So I slightly misapplied my trig identity. I apologize for the confusion. I thought I was missing something, but I just went on ahead with it. All right. So here is our average power relationships. A reactive power relationship. So reactive power is simply the imaginary part of our complex power. which comes out to be three VP IP sine theta Z or root three VL IL sine theta Z. too far. All right. Our apparent power. Three phase. Is simply going to be three VP IP, which will be equal to root three. VLIL and finally our three phase power factor is simply the ratio of the average power divided by the apparent power or cosine theta z, which is valid for both phase-based quantities and line-based quantities. Jared. TF3 phi, so it's three phase. All of these are three phase, three phase, three phase, three phase, because we're dealing with three phase circuits. Technically speaking, here, the power factor in a three phase circuit is literally the exact same. So the power factor for a balanced three phase load is the same thing for the power uh, as the power factor for just a single phase of the load. Um, because how could it not be? They're all operating with the exact same angle. All right. Three phase power factor correction. We have two options. So let's say generically that we have a balanced three phase source over here. 
Now this represents the A terminal, B terminal. Let's scooch that down. And down here, the C terminal. And over here on the right hand side, we have a balanced three phase load. A, B, and C. And for the sake of argument, let's say that we're using lossless transmission lines to connect the two, just to make the math slightly easier. Okay. So if we want to power factor correct this system, I'm going to actually make a copy of this. start writing on it. Okay. We have two options in which we can do it. The first of which is to connect our capacitor bank in a Y configuration. Okay. So what that might look like would be something like this. We connect from the A phase down here to some capacitor C where this node down here constitutes the neutral connection for our capacitor bank. Then we would connect from the B phase down to the neutral with a second capacitor. And finally, from the C phase to the neutral, with a third capacity. Clear. It is not required that the neutral of this capacitor bank be connected to the neutral of the load or the source, meaning this is perfectly valid for any three phase system. Now we'll find out pretty shortly, we won't ever actually do this for a reason that has nothing to do with the presence of a neutral or not. Our second option let's call this CY. Our second option is to go with a delta configured capacitor bank. So between the A and B phase, we would have some capacitance C delta. Between the B and C phase, we would have some capacitance C delta. And then between the A and C phase, we would have some capacitance C delta. There are two things that make three phase power factor correction more difficult than single phase power factor correction. The first of which is that you have to remember that there are three capacitors. Okay, I know that sounds dumb, but I've seen too many of not you guys specifically, but too many uh, electrical engineering 223 students exams and homeworks where they figure out what the difference is in the, you know, uh, S new minus S hold to get S cap, but they do that on a three phase basis and then just use that value to figure out what C is without taking into account that they're supposed to be three capacitors. So they literally should have just divided their answer by three and they would have gotten it correctly. Now, the other issue is remember that I'm going to call this S 
cap one face. Okay. So if we're correcting only a single phase, and then we would do that to all of the, our phases, remember that S cap one phase is negative J omega C, whether it be a Y connection or a delta connection, doesn't particularly matter for this equation, times VRMS squared where VRMS here represents the voltage drop present across the capacitor terminals. This voltage is going to have literally a different value depending on whether you are using a Y connected bank or a delta connected bank. Right? So let's work an example to illustrate. All right. Say it again so I can so think the about it. The magnitude of the voltage is going to be the same as either the Y connected port and you put your um, So if we had a if we had a Y connected source and a Y connected capacitor bank, then we would use we have a Y connected source and a delta connected capacitor bank. Then we would use the Y and voltages at the source. Yes, that's correct. Yes. If we had a Y connected source and a Y connected capacitor bank, we would use the phase voltages. Right. Okay. So let's say that we have the following problem a balanced. Three phase source feeds balanced twenty four megavolt ampere load operating at a power factor of 0 0.78 lag. If the line voltages are 34.5 kilovolts RMS at 60 hertz. Determine the value of C such that The total load has a power factor of zero point nine four. Okay. All right, so a couple of things that I want to point out here. I give you the power for a three phase load. It represents the total power of all three phases, unless I say it absorbs blah, blah, blah power per phase. 
So always assume that this is the total power being absorbed by the load, unless you are specifically told otherwise. Okay. All right. So from this information, how do we get the complex power absorbed by our load prior to power factor correction? So do it. Tell me what tell me what the relationship is. What are we given here? What does this 24 megavolt amperes represent? Apparent power. Okay. So we're given the apparent power and we're given the power factor. How do I get complex power? Take the uh power factor sign the power factor is angle. Mm -hmm. And then right. angles. Yeah. Exactly right. So because I gave you the apparent power, you don't need to do any work to get the magnitude of the complex power. It's literally given to you. Okay. So S old in this case is 24 megavolt amperes arc cosine of 0 0.78, which looks like 24 angle 34 excuse me 38.74 degrees megavolt amperes which is the same as 18.72 plus j 15.016 Megavolt amperes. All right. So now we are at a point where we need to make a decision. And it's actually a kind of trivial decision to make. Okay. And it's effectively which version of our power factor correction equation do we want to use, right? Do we want to use the one that yields or uses p old and then tangent theta old minus theta new over omega vrms squared or we do or want oh, excuse me or do we want to use the one that is negative q cat over omega vrms squared the first one okay all right so what two pieces of information of that first equation did we get in this analysis. Theta old and P old. Exactly right. This guy right here. Theta old. This guy right here is P old prefix. We gotta be careful about because we correct a single phase and then we duplicate that three times. We don't correct all three phases with a single capacitance. So, uh, Jacob, how do I get this three phase average power to a single phase, phase average power? Divide it by three, it is literally that simple. So P old one phase is 18.72, uh, let's see, megawatts divided by three. So that's gonna look like 6.24 megawatts, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can divide by three in my head with easily divisible numbers. All right. Alexis, how do I get theta and nu? It's going to be 
the arc cosine of the new power factor. Yeah. So theta nu, theta nu is all about what we want the system to behave like after power factor correction has occurred, which is why we look at PF nu. So this is going to be the inverse cosine of 0 0.94. Brandon, where's my mistake? Exactly right. Because the power factor is leading, I need to have a negative sign out front. Uh, so the negative arc cosine of 0 0.94 is negative 19. Point nine five degrees. All right. We have come to another decision to make. Do we want to use a Y connected bank or a delta connected bank? Actually, which one do you want to do first? I guess because we're going to do both of them just to illustrate the problem. Pardon? We don't know. I intentionally didn't tell you. <laughs> okay. So because we know the equivalent delta connected voltages, that seems reasonable enough. All right. So Uh, just as a quick aside here, omega is going to be 2 pi times 60 hertz, which is 120 pi radians per second. Okay, so for a delta connected capacitor bank, stop. Being difficult computer. There we go. We know that C is equal to P old times tangent theta old minus tangent theta new all over omega. times VL squared, right? Where VL represents our line voltages that we were given. If we plug in our results here from the previous steps of our analysis, we should find that we get an answer of 16.204 microfarads. All right. Now let's look for a Y connected load. So we're going to have C is equal to P old times the tangent theta old minus the tangent of theta new. Divided by omega. I'm going to call it BP here, but we really mean a Y connected voltage. Okay, squared. Well, BP is equal to our line voltage VL over root three, right? So when we square VP, we're simply gonna have VL squared divided by three, since that fraction is in the denominator, what this is gonna look like is three, in the numerator 
and VL squared in the denominator, which means it's literally just three times our previous value or 48.612 microfarads. That's the size of each capacitor per phase that we need to use to correct to this particular power factor in a Y connected configuration. Sorry, that should be just for a Y connected capacitor bank because the load doesn't care. So Ian, you've pretty much nailed it already. Why would we choose one way versus the other? Okay. There is a trade-off here. It's not necessarily intuitively obvious, but a 48.612 microfarad capacitor is physically three times as large as the 16.2 whatever microfarad capacitor, right? So the, the delta connected capacitor is physically smaller and should ostensibly cost less money. The other thing that we have to consider though, is that the voltage rating for our delta connected capacitor is higher than the voltage rating for our Y connected capacitor because it experiences a larger voltage drop across it. So those are the two things that we should take into consideration. What governs whether we use a Y connected or a delta connected is typically whichever one we can get cheaper, but we need to look at both the voltage ratings and the size to make that decision. The overwhelming majority of the time is the delta connector. Why is it a good thing to have a large voltage? It needs a larger, larger voltage rating because VL is larger than VP by a factor of root three. So, I mean, if, if you had a voltage rating of, let's say, the capacitors that you got were rated for 10 kVA, the line voltage is 13.5 kVA, you just can't use it. All right, that is the last thing that I wanted to talk about. So on Wednesday, uh, I can come with some problems prepared or we can just have a review session or some combination thereof. What would you guys like? Combination, okay, I'll bring some problems. Um, where do you feel probably some numerical problems regarding power calculations and all that kind of good stuff since we didn't really do a whole heck of a lot of that here, although it is, the same thing as the single phase, but yeah, okay. Um, anything else that you feel it would be helpful for me to prepare? Yeah. 